Welcome back to Watchbox Studios and Watches Tonight. I'm your host, Tim Masso. This evening, we are considering watches without boxes and papers and the damage that can do to your investment, why you probably don't want to buy that way, and we discuss the greatest mistakes in general made by watch collectors. All of that plus viewer wrist shots tonight on Watches Tonight. Let's see who is joining in. Okay, we've got Edward Ledden of Sweden, Matt Foster, we've got Marcus T of Germany joining in. Welcome to all of you. I see Joe Pinto from Louisville. We've got friends from Far Flung joining in, and of course we've got Sean on the switcher. He's the man who makes the pictures happen. Okay, what we file in and we fill the chat box, uh, it strikes me that First, you're going to want to open up a different window and keep me streaming. Check out thewatchbox.com. That's where all the fun stuff is. And second, once you start looking at these watches, you begin to notice that some of them sort of have faces. Uh, Paradolia strikes in the form of the IWC Big Pilots Watch 5002. See? There's a little face up at 12 o'clock. The FP Journe Chronomet Resonance third generation just looks like it's winking at me. You know, one eye winking, just a secret between me and my watch, like it knows something and we're in on it. Or there's the obvious example from Russia, although that one's a little bit more overt. But still, you see it on cars too. Consider my old Fisker Karma, a Henrik Fisker design that was undoubtedly a chip off the old block. And in the Bentley Molsen, a car so clearly inspired by a cartoon frog that I'm convinced this Bentley is actually a secret rebus for Mr. Toad's wild ride. I see what you're doing there, Bentley. Oh, I see. Let's see who's joining in. We got a lot of friends. We got Mr. No Date, Mez9, Joe Pinto, Dave Opencar, Time Hill, Hale Bop, Scott Wexlin, Matt Wilson, Richard Combs from South Florida, a longtime friend of the show, Joe Tyson from Apex, North Carolina, Renside, Logan Hall, 3939 from Albuquerque, and we've got Richard from the east of England, Britt Swiss, Mikhail Z joining in, Hans N, Nolan Reed, John N, Alexi Samola of Finland, and Gel Mibson. Welcome to all of my friends. I asked you answered viewer wrist shots. Let's see what you got. Starting with Seb, who takes his Vacheron Constantin Tourbillon to the center of the action at Wimbledon. Great shot right there. Gilberto captures local history and his Vacheron Constantin overseas chronograph. We have Jonathan C., who shares in Miami a very Miami watch in his yellow gold Alanga Unzona Richard Langa. Looking good. Tom G. of the UK showcases his Rolex Explorer in the hills of the Lake District. Another very nice on-scene shot. Abdul R. frames and Austin Healy with his Citizen in Germany. Watches and wheels of a very different type. Guys, send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Let's see who else is joining in. We've got Watchusiest staying up late, or is it early by now, in Dubai. We've got Stefan01. We've got Glenn Watkins from the UK. Random Rob. We've got Ahmad A. Mark S. And Mark is begging me, pleading really, to retire this shirt. I love this shirt. This is, this is one of the best shirts I own. This is a gift from the company. This is free. And then we've got Jeffrey D. saying hello from Western Massachusetts. We've got Paolo V. joining in from the Night Shift in Italy, staying up late with us. And Eddie Landsberg from Chicago, a longtime friend. Gail Mibson. All the best from Germany. Guys, thanks for joining in. If you got up late, if you stayed up early, I am grateful. So, let's talk about mistakes that watch collectors make. And this is a big one. It's got to be the headliner. It's got to come first. The whole losing box and papers thing, both on the buying side and the selling side. Why you don't want to do this and when it's going to make the biggest impact on your investment. So, I've previously spoken about mistakes that watch collectors make when buying or selling watches, but today, I'm going to speak about a whole swath of errors. I've made some of them myself. This one is probably the most avoidable. So, when we spoke last week about the growing watch collector disdain for refinishing of watches, we expressed that often factory metal in any condition, any condition at all, is preferable to some sort of 
polishing after the fact. Even better established, and I think all of us get this innately, is the importance of full set watches that are sold with boxes, warranty documents, manuals, packing stickers, accessories, and even dealer level documentation such as bills of sale and subsequent service receipts for the watch. Plus there are things like bracelet links, alternate straps and clasps. All of this has value. So there was a time in the 90s and the 2000s, yes, as late as the late 2000s, when people, especially in major watch tour hubs simply threw these boxed sets out or they would go and they would buy a watch on vacation and they would fail to follow up and collect the sets or ask that they be mailed to their actual residence 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 out of the country or out of the state so no longer here are a few cases where boxes papers and accessories really make a difference okay first the more modern the watch when the watch is modern, you've got to have everything. With vintage watches, condition is king. And condition is what dictates nine times out of 10, maybe even 95% of the time, what a watch is going to be worth. Originality, condition, all of that. An unpolished case, unmarred dial, correct bezel, correct hands, none of it touched. Basically, a watch thrown in a drawer and forgotten for 60 years. That's what dictates value in the vintage realm. But it's not enough by itself to sell a modern watch for top dollar because in the modern era, people know you're supposed to keep the boxed sets. So when you don't, it seems outrageous and it will seriously devalue the watch. The conventions for collecting modern watches, buying and selling them are very different from the vintage realm. Now, if you do have a full boxed set, long path 50 fathoms from the 50s or 60s, that's exceptional. That's an incredible thing. That'll headline an auction, but it's not normal. Okay, also important, the more generic the watch, the more important it is to have perks like original bill of sale, service receipts from subsequent service, and original receipt from the vendor. All of the boxes, papers, and accessories, because there are many submariners kicking around. Many, many submariners. But if you have everything that could conceivably come with that watch from Rolex and the Rolex authorized dealer, you've got a little bit of a leg up, or at the very least, you're in the running to get top dollar. Because there are many examples, even in a market where that watch is marked up from the time it's sells. The bottom line is the best examples that are going to get the biggest markup are going to be examples with the full set. Now, the more valuable the watch, this becomes a bigger and bigger deal. With something like an Oris, I hate to say this, but no one really cares. If it's missing the box and papers, it's a $3,500 watch, take off 500 bucks, maybe even less, maybe just 10%, maybe take off 350 bucks. It's not a big deal. It's not the end of anything. It's still an attractive watch, a fun watch, and a watch whose primary selling point is that it represents good value. That doesn't really change. When you get into elite timepieces and elite pricing, all of a sudden it's a different world. Consider something like a Patek Philippe Split Seconds Chronograph, the 5370P, especially the new blue dial model, hot off the presses, brand new, if you lack even the certificate of origin, I'm not talking the boxes and the papers and the accessories, just the one piece of paper, the certificate of origin, something that Patek will not reissue ever, even if you beg, that watch could easily be worth 30% less. And we are talking well into six figures here, easily. It might even be impossible to sell that watch if you don't have the certificate. That's the kind of difference we're talking when we get into the realm of elite brands and pricing and lost accessories. Now, it's generally only smart. Here, let's talk about when it's smart to buy a watch that does not have a full set. There are really only two occasions. You know with something like a branded title on a car, if you buy a rebuilt Ford Bronco or you buy a rebuilt Jeep Wrangler, you pretty much have to get an absolute darling of a price and then expect to run it into the ground, driving it for 15 years in New England winters. So it's very similar in the world of watches. First, a watch you're never going to sell. That car you're going to drive for 15 years until it falls apart. If you want to buy a Patek 5370P without the papers, sure, you might get it for very little money relative to what it would sell for with the papers. But if you plan to wear it forever, make it an heirloom, you never have to think about what it would resell for. You're just going to buy and hold. Then I could see it. 
The watch is distinctive enough and sophisticated enough. The counterfeiting is not really a problem. It's just going to be something you never have the opportunity to sell for decent money. Second, if the deal is absolutely so sweet you can't deny it. Like when I bought my JLC Platinum No. 2 Tourbillon, I knew this was a watch that retailed for $130,000 in the early 2000s. Like 2003, that was a $130,000 watch. So when I got mine for thirty-five grand, I didn't really complain. I knew I was getting good value for the money and that I'd be able to sell it for exactly what I paid. And in fact, that's exactly what I did. So if the deal is just too good to be true, counterfeiting's not a problem, there's no questions about the provenance or the condition, then yeah, that would be a case where saving $95,000 is a good argument for buying that watch without the boxes and the papers. So, jumping into the box right here, we've got Alex O joining in. We've got Abdul, who is a longtime friend of the show, and his watch is in the show tonight. We've got Jabo Surf of Adelaide, Australia. Dan CT saying, I'm never going to sell a watch, they're mine forever. I do know some guys who take that approach. They, they either only buy new or they only buy, they never sell. A lot of guys will buy the watches, they'll add them to the collection, they'll put the boxes in like a separate storage space where they've got a mountain of material, and once the door shuts, it never reopens. The watch is in the collection in perpetuity. And then we have Justin D asking, hi Tim, what's the watch box criteria of picking a watch that will increase in value? For example, F.P. Journe, Roger Dubuis Sympathy. I think right now the formula seems to be early examples of important watches by independence. Like, if you look at a modern-day Roger Dubuis watch that's two, three, five years old, it, it's got huge depreciation. But if you look at a Roger Dubuis Sympathy from the 90s, first, they're objectively very nice watches. Not everyone feels that way about modern Roger Dubuis watches. Second, Dubuis himself turned out to be something of a pioneer. I don't think anyone could have anticipated five, six, seven, eight years ago what a big deal independent horology was going to become at the high end of the market. And the early Dubuis really did help to break those barriers as 1995 when he established SoGem with Carlos Diaz. Uh, you know, who was doing it back then? Very few. That was before Erwerk, that was before F.P. Journe, that was before MB&F, it was before the Harry Winston Opus series. Uh, that was a real pioneering brand. So in general, early works by important independent watchmakers and then scarcity, scarcity in general. I think with Rolex, it's not as though they don't make a lot of them, but relative to demand, they're scarce. And that's key. Scarcity is not a matter of production numbers. It's always measured relative to demand. And we think Debitun is perhaps a brand on the rise because recently auction results have been very positive. So look to auction results as well. So scarcity, early and attractive works by important independents, and then watch what the auction market is doing, because the auction market used to be all about vintage watches and finding out who is going to pay too much for an old Daytona next. And that used to be what it was about, and it still is partly what it's about, but the newer watches made in the last 20 years, and in some cases in the last 15 years, are starting to make an impact at auction, and they're starting to headline auctions, so definitely watch that space. That's what we do here at Watchbox. It's not rocket science. If it were, I wouldn't be doing it. Okay. Now, let's talk about viewer wrist shots number two. I asked, you answered, Mohammadi e from Dubai at Atlantis Dubai at the aquarium with his Omega Seamaster 300. Looking good. There was another shot he gave me that had the fish in focus, but I think you guys would prefer the watch. Fred P. from Beach Haven, New Jersey, takes his Rolex Sea Dweller 43 to the Jersey Shore. Summer pastime here on the East Coast. Eric S. looks the part back at the office with his JLC Master Ultra Thin 34. And Ryan D. of Portland, Maine, captures a stunning sunset with his Rolex Yacht Master Steel Platinum. Looking good, Ryan. Simon H. and his Watchbox bought JLC Reverso are ready for some European travel in Munich. Thank you for trusting our company, Simon. Guys, send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. A quick promo. Speaking of Dubai, we just spoke of Dubai, and now we speak of one of the official airlines of the United Arab Emirates. They've got two. We're talking about Etihad. We're actually partnering with them through August 16th to give away two tickets to any location in the Etihad network and we're giving an IWC Pilots Watch chronograph away. So check our website, check the blog, check the sweepstakes or email tmaso at thewatchbox.com and we'll get you entered. That is to win two tickets through Etihad Airlines which is way cush 
and the IWC Pilot's Watch chronograph. So, mistakes watch collectors make. Let me jump back to the chat box real quick. Rick Remaker joining in, a good friend of the show. Thanks for joining in and catching us live. Rick, we've got Hans N. asking, Rick, how was bike riding? And I've got to hear the answer. Uh, oh, I don't want to miss this. Saying, Hans, we don't ride until October 1st. Guys, if you are interested in riding your bike with me in Philadelphia, if you are in the area, we will go out and we will do a road ride. I am all about that, if you guys are local. And if you make the trip, I cannot deny you. Mark S. saying, Tim's got two tickets to Paradise. Yes, Paradise is in the Etihad network. I can confirm that. And Eddie Money would be proud. What else is going on? We've got The Real Two Fly asking, Hi Tim, when are you coming back to Long Island? Would love to talk watches in person. We've had a few questions about this, and I owe a visit to some of you guys. I'll be back in early September to meet up with my friend. I've bought him a Zinn watch. He's going to be getting married, so I will be in town for at least three or four days. We can definitely catch up. Now, mistakes watch collectors make. Here's a counterintuitive error that I'm seeing more and more often. Servicing watches too often. There's a little 6497 I was playing with at my, on my bench. I've got a bench at home. That one's going through a service. But five to 10 years should be the rule for most new watches. There was actually a Rolex document that came out around the time they launched the five-year warranty where they explained that the service interval on a Rolex watch today for practical purposes with the technology they have in lubricants and the quality of manufacturing, it should be five to 10 years. And Rolex is pretty representative of watchmaking in the meat of the market. So certain older, less precisely manufactured, more worn, or perhaps even highly complicated watches should be serviced more often than a modern Rolex or Omega. That said, we're talking three to five year service intervals. The two to three year service intervals that the industry advocates are absolutely ridiculous. Like if we were in the era of 19th century pocket watches and your watchmaker were servicing the watches with literal whale oil, then yeah, maybe two years would be reasonable. But it ain't the case. Not anymore. Not in the modern era. And even a complication should be able to make three to five years between services and overhauls. Consider what your basically sacrificing financially if you do service your watch every two to three years. Consider these prices. This is from Omega. And I actually give them a lot of credit for publishing this stuff. But when I took my Omega Seamaster Diver 300 meter from 2002 to get serviced, I paid 600 bucks with Omega, which is to say that's an awful lot of money for a watch that once retailed for $2,100. And if you've got a complicated piece, such as a chronograph, for example, especially a chronograph in precious metal, you will be paying $1,000 or more from most brands to have that chronograph serviced. Service twice as often as you need, and you'll be paying twice as much. If you have an entire array of watches, let's say you have five to 10 watches, like many collectors on this show do, think about that. Paying an extra $1,000 per watch every 24 months, that is a lot of coin. I would rather put that money into buying more watches. Now, I would also say this, two-year warranties. A lot of brands give you two-year service warranties, and these send the wrong message. I think the industry needs to accept that if you assemble and regulate and lubricate a watch, when you're preparing it to go to market for the first time, bringing that watch back and sending it out, serviced, lubricated, and adjusted, that should entail, given similar treatment from the same factory, exactly the same warranty you would give as a new watch. So if factory assembled is five years, factory serviced should also be five years. And I don't like these two-year service warranties because I think they're a little bit dishonest. You should be able to give just as much warranty on a serviced watch as a newly assembled watch. Another problem, and this is the opposite, water testing too infrequently. You need to do this often. I say every 12 months. Do not wait, do not hesitate. Most jewelers and dealers will do this for free, and well, they should. All brand boutiques will do this for free. This is a big deal. The most expensive service quotes I have ever seen, and they were both from Audemars Piguet, involved water-damaged watches. One of them was a standard Royal Oak chronograph, so not a highly advanced watch. A Frédéric Piguet movement, a nice movement, but not something that's alien or exotic. Not Audemars Piguet, Renault, Papi, not some sort of Royal Oak concept, but a $10,000 service 
on a watch that had some water intrusion. And by some water intrusion, I mean the owner caught it almost immediately and got it to the brand very quickly, within two or three days. At that point, $10,000 worth of damage was done on a watch that was, at the time, worth about fifteen dollars to $18,000 back in 2015. That was a monstrous service charge. So, all of these expensive service charges I've seen, ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000, have involved some kind of water intrusion. It's no joke. It's not just damage to the movement. It's probably replacement of a dial and reconditioning of the case. There's a lot going on there. Now, treat the thing, the, the, the number one threat to your watch, as a cyclical problem. Test every 12 months, typically before pool and beach season. And it's really important to do this because water resistance wanes faster than a watch's mechanical integrity. Service intervals for your movement, yes, five to ten years for most standard watches. But water resistance, which is a combination of assembly, seal lubricant, and seal condition, as well as handling and treatment of the watch, that can erode as quickly as one year, even from new manufacture or a factory service. So always check. Check once a year. Check more than once a year. It's usually free. There is no harm in checking too often. And the price of a mistake can be catastrophic. I would say you need to treat every watch of unknown service history, like when you buy a pre-owned watch. If it's not coming from a dealer like Watchbox, where we're going to do a water test on that dive watch and check it. But if you've got a watch of unknown service history, treat it like a vintage watch. With a vintage watch, we always pretend that there's just no water resistance. Assume no water resistance unless it is positively tested otherwise. Now, that's what you need to do with any used watch. You're buying a 10-year-old Gerard Perigo Seahawk, have it water tested. You're buying a 2-year-old Omega Seamaster, have it water tested. Never let this slide. And don't fall for the bought new in box, like new in box smokescreen. A watch that looks new might A, not run, because the lubricants are so old in the movement, and B, have all the water resistance of a 1980s minute repeating pocket watch. Take water resistance seriously. Note how many factory warranty extensions specifically mention that you need to have the watch water tested by a dealer at the time of extension. There's a reason for that. They don't time it on a chronoscope, but they will water test it because it has a huge bearing on their ability to offer that extra year of warranty. What's going on right here? We've got Ben Z saying, I just wore my Datejust in the Atlantic Ocean and my Tudor Black Bay in Lake Michigan. We have Simon T saying, Saul is the man. I'm not sure who I missed. I'm guessing this isn't a reference to Better Call Saul. We have Rick Remaker saying, or you can buy a Ming and have it sent back immediately for service. Fact. What kind of service will you receive? What else is going on right here? Anyone in the UK have experience with places doing these tests for free? Any brand boutique, Zenith, Breguet, Omega, will conduct a water test for you. It t costs them nothing. It's done with air. There's no risk. They will water test the watch for you for free if they're worth their salt. And any brand boutique should be able to do this. And right here, we have Horatio saying, Rolex is famous for ruining the value of vintage watches during service by replacing parts, for example, dial or bezel with patina, or by polishing the watch. How do we deal with that? That's another major mistake that watch collectors make. I wasn't going to throw it in because it's pretty specialized, but never send a vintage watch back to the brand ever for service, ever for service. They're set up to service mass-produced modern watches, and mistakes can be made. Rolex does try to set apart vintage watches, but if, for example, they can't easily repair the feet of the dial by soldering, they won't. A, a brand will not do that, whereas a vintage specialist will find some way to repair damaged dial feet to keep that original dial in the watch. There will be ways, whether they involve soldering or shellac, they will find a way to make it work. A vintage specialist understands this. A big brand like Rolex, Omega, or Breitling, or even JLC does not. Now, what else is going on here? Nathan Silva saying, Patek doesn't list the prices of servicing grand complications. Any idea of how much it is? Yes. 
I have seen prices on grand complications, not from Patek, but in general, anywhere between $5,000 on the low end for a JLC minute repeater, which I thought was very fair, to over $50,000 for an FP Journe Grand Sonnerie that, to my knowledge, did not require any parts. So that was a cleaning, oiling, and adjustment. So yes, grand complications, expect, if it's something like a 5016, that you're gonna be paying five figures. Maybe not high five figures, maybe not 50 grand, but I would assume for a 5016, for a 5370, for something like a 5270, or a 5970, or a 5004, yes, five figures, lots of money. Although I would expect something like an IWC grand complication because it's 7750 base would be less. All right, settling for something less than ideal. Never settle for less than your dream watch. If you get a fixer upper or a watch that's good considering the condition or a watch that doesn't have the box, the papers or the certificate of origin, the warranty card, the clasps, the bracelet links, you're gonna wind up with an absolute disappointment. As disappointing as Shelley Long's film career, in fact. Now, here's the deal. Never settle where dream watches and emotional purchases are concerned because, frankly, the first failure will be in your heart. You'll realize you did not get what you want, and in the world of luxury watches, you're still gonna spend a lot of money to get that watch you didn't really want. There are no cheap mistakes in this hobby. I would also say, being the surest path to dissatisfaction, settling takes many forms. Condition is a big one. You saw the money pit right there. Well, there's another one. And I should mention, if you buy cheap, you buy twice. That's a lesson my mom taught me, and it's very true. I would also say you're gonna wind up spending money to fix a problem that had you purchased a watch at a higher price, you might not even have considered. Sometimes it makes a lot more sense to just buy the $10,000 watch than to buy the $7,000 watch and put $4,000 worth of work into it because it needs movement parts or case components. So don't settle. And I would say this, price is another way people settle because they don't have the money up front to buy what they really want. If you want a 50 Fathoms, save the money and buy a 50 Fathoms. Now, if you're a kid in high school, okay, I get it. You're not gonna have $10,000 for a watch anytime soon. In that case, buy yourself a nice G-Shock, save your money, set your sights on the long term, and get that thing as a reward when you score your first big job. It's coming. But for those of you who are watch collectors and already into the hobby, and you're talking about maybe, I don't know, $6,000 watch now or $10,000 watch next year, wait until next year, get the $10,000 watch. Or understand what your threshold of satisfaction is. It might be that you can't get this watch right here, but for 4,500 bucks, you can get a used Omega Seamaster Diver 300 meter and feel quite fulfilled. But you might realize that you would not feel that way if you spent, I don't know, less than $2,000 to buy a Longines Hydro Conquest. So understand if you're not gonna get your dream watch that you're still gonna be happy with your fallback and understand how far is too back to fall back. Now, I would also say this, if you want a Ferrari 550 and a Fiat is affordable to you now, wait unless you're actually in love with the Fiat. Every once in a while, a guy who wants a Ferrari 550, like me, will look at a $10,000 Fiat 500e and say, you know what, for junk money, that would be a hell of a lot of fun as a rechargeable go-kart to tool around locally. But if you want the Ferrari, this just isn't gonna satisfy. It's not gonna hit the spot. So I would say, understand whether you would be happy only with the Ferrari or maybe a $60,000 Alfa Romeo 4C that falls somewhere between the extremes of a Fiat and the lavish expenses of a vintage Ferrari. Now, jumping into the box right here, we've got Van Lux joining in from Vancouver. We've got Mr. Paradigm 1981 saying, don't discount the Abart, and that's true. If you want to get one of those turbocharged Abart Fiat 500s, they're a lot of fun. Doug DeMuro liked that one. And I gotta say, if you're gonna buy one of those cheap Fiat 500s, consider the electric. People say that's the most fun you can have in a 500. And, and I might even test the theory. What else is going on right here? We have Rick Remaker saying, service on a Patek took 37 weeks, ouch. One of his Pateks, let me see if I can find which Patek it was. Let me know, Rick, because I missed the prior comment. I didn't see which Patek took 37 weeks. And then we've got Jabo Surf saying, the 4C is half-baked garbage. 
You guys have strong opinions about cars, watches, and my shirt. That's what I've learned from this episode. What else is going on? Horatio is saying, I would be happy to settle for a 308 GTB. If you're going to go for a 308 GTB, get the four valve or step up, pay 86, 85 grand and get a 328. So much better. All right. Viewer wrist shots. Luke M hits the road. Back to our wheels and watches. With his VC overseas chronograph and Alfa Romeo again, this time the Stelvio SUV. Neil W motors with his Jaguar XF and Cardio Cartier, Santos de Cartier. This is the midsize, I believe. And then we've got Kunal M from Reno winning the motoring stakes first with his Lexus RCF and Patek Calatrava 5196, but also with his Casio GA2100 Casioke at the wheel of the Bentley Turbo R. You win. <laughs> you win, Kunal. Roy S. saddles up his Honda RC51, the famed Ducati killer, and Omega Seamaster Diver 300 meter at Lake Tahoe. And Dylan L. and Iron Man offer an illuminating look at the Rolex Air King. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Rick is helping me out here. I asked him which watch was out for 37 weeks, and then he helped me out by telling me exactly which one it was. It was the 5524G travel time. So, yeah, service is a big pain. And if you need to not lose your watch, for excessive amounts of service time, again, don't service too often, then it's that much easier to bear. 37, well, what was it? 37 weeks, once every five years, six years, seven years, is a lot easier than once every two years, three years. Okay, back to mistakes watch collectors make. Sending money in advance. This is a huge problem with people buying watches online, especially in the gray market where someone will source a watch usually from a dealer that has excessive stock, and then they will sell that on the gray market. The problem is a lot of dealers that work in that space, and you can see them on Chrono24, they post stock photos of watches. They will take your money, and then they will take their sweet time finding the watch. This is like making an indefinite length loan to a stranger. And I don't know if you want to make a $50,000 unconditional indefinite loan to a stranger, even if they're not fly-by-night folks like the timepiece gentleman or something. You don't want to go out giving strangers that much money if the money can be in your bank account or in investments doing work for you or possibly getting the watch elsewhere if you manage to find it before the gray market dealer does. So do not send money for phantom inventory. If it's a ghost watch, if there's a stock photo on their website or on Chrono24, refrain. Never send money in advance. I would also say don't lose watches. This happens surprisingly often. There was a guitarist for a prominent classic rock band who a few years ago bought a watch from us to replace his Patek Philippe Calatrava 5107. And then he later moved his presumably large house to a new location. So he bought a new mansion somewhere else. He found the old watch after he'd already received an insurance payout. You might not be so lucky. I've seen watches lost on vacation. I've seen watches lost at the beach. I've seen watches that get lost in or at a pool, at casinos. And yes, when people move their house, they do lose watches. So don't lose your watch. This seems to be surprisingly common. At least once a year, some collector will contact me telling me he has outright lost a watch and he wants to buy a new identical example from me. Don't be that guy. Let's see what else is going on in the box right here. A lot of friends. We've got Burning Mr. B saying, Tim is so funny and light on his feet, which is extraordinary considering I actually do this show seated. I'm that good, guys. Light on my feet while sitting on my butt. What else is going on here? We have a question from Morris asking, what's wrong with his shirt? I don't know. Some people don't like the, the I guess, the gradient of color. Um, you know, if this were a Moser, it would be called a Fume, and they would charge a lot of extra money for it. What else is going on in the box here? We got a Mick in Florida, one of our friends from the southeastern U.S., and then we've got Andrew Mark saying, no man loses a watch at a casino. I have seen all sorts of watch losses that involve casinos and hotels, and you're probably right in the sense that no one just loses a watch. They might lose it, but they don't just lose it at a casino or casino resort. What else is going on right here? Of watch losses, 
the most notable, high-flying, most prominent, and pop culture are undoubtedly celebrity muggings. Do not get robbed. This is a bigger and bigger problem with luxury watches, and it seems to be everywhere, regardless of city or nationality right now. McLaren F1 driver Lando Norris, who's otherwise having a great season in F1, was robbed last month after the Euro 2020 final between England and Italy at Wembley. His Richard Mille was taken right off his wrist as he got into his McLaren, meaning this happened in a heavily trafficked thoroughfare outside a major sporting event. And here's the deal, he's not alone in the past or present. He could have asked former F1 chief Bernie Ecclestone for advice about not wearing a prominent watch in public. That happened back in 2010. He was mugged for his Hublot, and Hublot, being Hublot, turned it into an ad. Now, this is the deal. There is a shocking amount of documented theft right now. Quickly Google luxury watch mugging or luxury watch theft. You will get tons of non-duplicative headlines from magazines, newspapers, and websites around the world, including some you didn't expect. And I have to say, Hall & Oates, which is usually pretty good at predicting female treachery, still failed to foresee this. Cops have not found the sub suspects, the women who are the now so-called Rolex rippers, but it's possibly a rich girl, and now she's gone too far. Don't lose your watch. Don't get mugged. Some advice. Be alert. Think ahead. Don't get complacent. Um, and have a sacrificial watch for travel. When you're in a neighborhood you don't know well, it doesn't have to be a bad neighborhood. If you don't know the neighborhood, don't go in hot wearing some sort of $100,000 Richard Meal watch. When you travel, bring something you're not afraid to get stolen. Uh, you know, a Swatch, a G-Shock, a Timex Iron Man, or have something that is an acceptable level of risk. Like with my Zin, I'm into it $2,000 when I sold my collection, I got a trade value on it from Watchbox, so I traded for this watch. If I were to get mugged, I would lose a lot of sentimental value, but $2,000 would not ruin me. Understand your threshold of pain and wear your watch accordingly. I would also say, uh, in general, don't get complacent. Highly trafficked thoroughfares might seem safe, but as Lando learned, it's also a great way for a thief to find a watch easily outside luxury hotels, operas, resorts, movies, places where people tend to wear high value watches, even in broad daylight, even when there are a lot of people present. Thieves are getting very bold. The guy who asks you the time might be the guy willing, or the girl in this case, as we saw, willing to steal the watch right off your wrist on the spot. And also, this is a good thing to think about, think twice about keeping large safes in your house. Some people think, oh, well, you know, I've got passports, or I've got guns, or I've got family, you know, valuables, and I'm going to keep my watch in a safe in my house with these things. But People who target high-value watches also target residential safes, and a safe in your house is not nearly as secure as a safety deposit box in an insured bank surrounded by guards and closed-circuit cameras. People can and will target houses that are known to have these kinds of safes. They will break the safe out, take it to another location while you're away, and then crack it there in a warehouse someplace. Or, if they're really bold, all they need to get into your safe is access to you when you're at home. Trust me, there are plenty of things folks can do to make you open a safe on the spot, especially when the costs are so minimal to you. A watch or your fingers, a watch or your eye, a watch or your life. Don't keep huge value in some sort of safe in your house. It's just not good gouge, as we used to say in the Navy. All right. We have right here Abdul saying the solution of mugging is buying unique watches that don't look attractive. Maybe that is the trigger for a revived classical small dress watch trend. It's probably true that if you have a Vacheron 6099 from 1955, no one is going to be swiping that off your wrist. Whereas if you're wearing some sort of Hublot, Bernie Ecclestone. What else is going on in the box right here? And we've got... ZJ asking, Tim, which Omega Moonwatch variation to get? Sapphire Sandwich, my favorite Omega Moonwatch is the 50th anniversary piece that came out uh, back in 2007. It was a limited edition, 
It was a Frederic Piguet base. It was 100 meters water resistant. It was a display case back, and it was a black enamel dial. And I would say get that, and if you just can't tolerate scratches, scuffs, and wear and tear on a watch, get a gray side of the moon. That would be my choice. Okay, viewer wrist shot number four. Gary and his Rolex Submariner soak in the sun at Mallorca, Spain. Michael C. puts it all together with the Citizen Blue Angels and Lego NASA series. I like that one. Nice ink, too. Daniel M. of Miami cruises the strip in South Florida, looking good with his millinery 4101. Pratham K., his Casio and his wife explore Lake Louise in Alberta, Canada. Looking good. I love the color of that water there. We've got Tony G. impresses with his incredible pocket watch collection. I asked for pocket watches, and Tony, you really answered the call. We've also got Zheng Wan rolling in his Rolex Daytona and Porsche 911 991.1. Very cool, guys. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com, and also check our website, thewatchbox.com, where we are partnering with Etihad Airways to give away two tickets anywhere in the Etihad network and an IWC Pilot's Watch chronograph. Check out our website under the blog for the sweepstakes. Now, other reasons people buy watches. A big mistake is peer pressure. This is a really big mistake. Some of it is friends, family, but it's mostly social media and the online watch scene, which has way too much influence from web forums that we frequent to community sites that also have a lot of pull in shaping tastes, including ours. Social media is the biggest pressure source, and let me tell you, it is real. This could not have happened without the proliferation of hype surrounding the last year of the Patek Philippe 5711. The 5711 as a $100,000 watch is a creation of Instagram, but the 5711 as a nearly $500,000 watch could only have happened if you're following the full blogosphere and social media scene. That is just nuts. Buying watches that don't fit. The watch has to fit. And it's not just about size. This is how I define fit. First, try before you buy. It's a big deal. Uh, but fit means security, comfort, and aesthetics. It's all three. Just because the watch will adhere to your wrist doesn't mean it's going to be comfortable, that it's going to feel secure, or that it's going to look right. Could I wear this Hublot Oceanographique 1000 meter? Yeah, I could put it on my wrist and it would stay put, but it wouldn't look right. It wouldn't feel right. I would be hugely self-conscious with that thing on my wrist. Fit is all of these things. It's security, it's ergonomics, and it's the way the watch looks. And though we hate to admit it, 90% of our attraction to the watches we buy is down to the way they look. And speaking of try before you buy, on a related note, if you ever buy remotely from another collector, a pre-owned vendor, it does not matter. Even if it's a new watch bought on some sort of shopping cart checkout from Cartier, never buy remotely without an ironclad right of return in writing from the seller. An approval period should be mandatory for an article of jewelry or clothing bought online. You don't know how that watch is going to look or fit or feel on your wrist. And Given how I just defined fit, you really have to have the option to wear it a little bit and then send it back with no obligation other than the shipping label and the insurance. That should be absolutely universal when buying a watch remotely. And that's why at Watchbox, we let you keep the watch for seven days before you have to make up your mind. And we have an unconditional, including I just don't like it, right of return. So whether you're dealing with an auction house, an individual, or a dealer, know the terms in advance, especially when you're buying online. Let's see what's going on in the box right here. Lots of comments and a fast-moving chat box that makes it hard for me to respond to all of your comments and all of your thoughts. And you guys have some great ones. We've got Leon, greetings from Norway. Asking another question, will Omega release a new Planet Ocean in 2022? Well, here's the thing. The last wholesale redesign of the Planet Ocean was in 2016. Before that, it was 2011. So, yeah, by that measure, we're just about due for a new Planet Ocean. Could come in 2022, could come in 2023, but we're definitely moving into the end of cycle for the current generation of Planet Ocean. What else is going on? Watch out, Tim. Why does Patek have no company-owned boutiques outside of Europe, London, Geneva, and Paris? Easy. If you don't have to own the lease, and you aren't responsible for paying for the inventory, and 
You strike the fear of God in your dealer. Why would you ever take on the obligations of owning a shop? The big drawback from having third-party dealers is that often you can't control how they price watches. You can't control how they ship watches to the aftermarket or the gray market. All of those watches at Costco, it's like our version of Tesco, I guess. It's a wholesale retailer. When you see an Omega or Patek at one of those like wholesale warehouses, something went very wrong. But it is super rare to see a Rolex or Patek there because they can generally control their dealers ironclad. So if you can control your dealer and not worry about discounting or weird shipments out the back door to the aftermarket, you would never sign 10-year leases for a boutique on Bond Street in England or Fifth Avenue in New York. You would never take on $2 million of inventory that you could sell at wholesale value to a dealer and take off your books and book the profit up front. That's why Patek doesn't have dealers. It's why Rolex doesn't have dealers. They have all the advantages of being able to sell the watches to a third-party vendor and really none of the disadvantages that come with loose cannon third parties that will sell the watches or discount the watches or bundle the watches. All of that isn't a problem when you're Patek or Rolex, but you've got to have control of your dealers. And for example, third-party vendors of Omega or Tag Heuer aren't nearly as reliable for the brands themselves. And then we've got Adam Crossfire saying, agree TB, the 39.5 milliliter Planet Ocean is so comfortable. And if you're going to buy a Planet Ocean, get the 39.5 and get it in black ceramic so it never shows anywhere. I hate scratches and scuffs. Guys, thank you so much. Remember, comment, subscribe. Let me know in the description below what you thought and what you would do to avoid losing your watch. And once again, thanks to Sean who makes the magic happen off screen. Time out, Tim out. Thanks to all of you. And thanks for logging on.